Hey everybody, welcome back to Living Traditions Homestead. Over the last couple videos, you guys have had a ton of questions for us, so we thought we would take some time today to try to answer some of the most popular questions from those last few videos. We were going to do half of this video out in the garden and then the other half here in the greenhouse, but you guys, we're having a ton of winds right now, which is actually pretty unseasonable for us. Right. Normally we have a really windy spring and then like all of a sudden the wind like quits until fall. Right. We're having storms. We've had storms over the last couple of days and followed by a couple windy days and today was just way too windy for us to film out in the garden. Right. We actually got two and a half inches of rain over the last just 12 hours. So it's really, it's just come down fast and man, it's it's really been a lot of rain very quickly. And that also is very unusual for us. Normally we have a pretty wet spring and then like the wind, the rain just like completely quits. And then over the summer, we almost kind of get into a drought every summer. Right. But so far, like two and a half inches this week, and I think last week we got an inch, so that's actually really great for us. Right. So all of that saying that we're in the greenhouse today <laughs> because we can put one of the sides down, kind of be out of the wind for you guys so you can actually hear us as we're talking. Now you guys have had a lot of questions about things revolving around what we've been doing in the garden and what we've been doing here in the greenhouse. So we're gonna kind of go through some of the questions. We've written some of them down, no real particular order. I think we'll start with the questions that pertain more to the outside garden first, and then we'll work into the greenhouse questions after that. Recently, we did a video where we showed you how we installed our irrigation system out in the garden. And actually, it's the same type of system that we're using here in the greenhouse. Kevin talked specifically about a specific type of uh, sprinkler emitter and a lot of you have had a really hard time finding those emitters and so you've asked us what should you do now. Those emitters are out of stock and they have no idea when they're going to be back in stock. Let me show you the emitters that we're talking about and then I'll give you my kind of opinion on what you should do until you can find the type that I use here in the greenhouse. When we did the video out in the garden and I was showing you guys how to set up the irrigation system, I showed you that these are the type of sprinkler emitters that we use in the greenhouse and in the garden. These are a special kind that are a pressure compensating emitter. And that means that all of them come on at the same time on the same amount of pressure and it's a much easier process to adjust these because if you adjust them at the beginning of the row, it adjusts the entire row. In that video, I said that these are the kind you should use and you should never use the kind that you have to adjust each sprinkler individually. Thinking back, what I probably should have said is, if at all possible, you should use this kind here because they are easier. But if you can't get these, which, you know, right after we did the video about that, I think there was kind of a run on these and they sold out and they haven't been back in stock ever since. If you can't get these, you can get ones that look very similar. They look like this. We've used these in the past as well. But these are an adjustable flow uh, sprinkler head. And basically each of these you can adjust individually by turning this so you can make the sprinkler really big or really small by adjusting this head. The reason that these are more difficult to use is because if you have a lot of buckets and say you have this one running here and it's a little too big and you adjust it, now it's going to affect all of the others. And it's just going to be harder and a harder process to get these adjusted. Once they're adjusted, they're pretty simple to use, uh, but they will take a little more time up front and maybe a little more, you know, every now and then to get them readjusted. So again, like I should have said is, if at all possible, get the pressure compensating, but if you can't find them, these are just fine to use. They will be just a little more work. What I would suggest is because these are really pretty inexpensive, if you can't get the pressure compensating, I would get these for now. Keep an eye for the keep an eye out for these to come back in stock and then once these come back in stock, replace these with the pressure compensating. That's what I would do. Luckily, the last time these were in stock, I bought quite a few, so I have a little bit of back stock for if any of these ever break. We have some extra ones, but 
Otherwise, I would definitely go back to these because it's better than having to hand water. The next question that we've had a lot recently is what do we do about squash bugs? Now here in Missouri, we have a ton of squash bugs and they are really like terrible on zucchini squash, anything in like the summer squash kind of uh, category, but you can also find them on melons and cucumbers. And squash bugs are just really a terrible thing to have to deal with and they're really not easy to get rid of. Now there are basically poisons that you can spray on all of your plants to try to control the squash bugs and that's not something that we are willing to do and we don't do. We really have two methods of controlling squash bugs. The first one is to find the squash bug adults on the plants. When we're out here we'll look for them, we'll pick them off and we will squish them to kill them and also we will look for their eggs and try to remove them from the plant. That is sometimes, you know, a once a day or twice a day kind of thing that we have to do in order to control them. Ultimately, in the end, when we cannot control the squash bugs anymore by picking them off and killing them, finding the eggs and taking them off is we allow the plants to grow as long as they can. When they're dying back, when they've gotten diseases or whatever, we end up just pulling the entire plant and starting over. We plant seed again. A lot of times we have enough time in our growing season to do this two or three times. You can see here in this bucket, there is no squash plants. Actually, I think this was um, a yellow crookneck squash plant. Recently it got completely filled with disease and bugs and everything and I just ripped it right out. So tomorrow I'm going to replant seed and that will germinate and we'll start all over again. Now the squash bugs have a limited life cycle. They don't produce many, many generations over the uh, growing season. So the second or third time that we plant for the zucchini and the other summer squash, they should really survive well and not be affected much by the squash bugs. But in the beginning, it's really hard for us because we don't want to put chemicals on our zucchini plants. Now, I do want to address one thing. We often are told and suggested that we use diatomaceous earth to control the squash bugs. And I'll tell you guys that that really for us is kind of a losing battle. Diatomaceous earth is a natural kind of powder that gets underneath the exoskeletons of hard bodied bugs like squash bugs and other things like beetles and actually uh, ladybugs, which is unfortunate. And it kind of breaks down and tears up the bugs and they ultimately die. The problem with diatomaceous earth is that once it's wet, it no longer works. So here in Southern Missouri, we have such heavy dew in the morning that the day after we apply the diatomaceous earth, it gets so wet that it no longer works. While diatomaceous earth is an organic option for controlling things like squash bugs, it's really a losing battle for us because we would literally need to apply it every single day. So the best thing for us to do is number one, pick them off and kill them as we can, find the eggs, and when it, things just get too bad, we just pull the plants and start over. At the end of the season, we have still gotten enough zucchini for us, our family members, the freezer, the freeze dryer. You know how prolific zucchini is and we always grow enough. The next question that we've gotten several times in the last couple weeks is about the soil test that we did out in our main garden area. As you know, we were having some issues out there with the compost that we put in those beds, and we wanted to do a soil test to kind of see where we were at and to try to help figure that out. If you haven't seen the video where we finally kind of figured out what was going on out there, go back and watch that. Today, I just want to talk to you about the soil test that we did. So the test that we used is something that I just ordered on Amazon. We're in no way affiliated with this company, but I was pretty happy with the way that it worked. It's called Rappi Test. Uh, this is a digital soil test and it's made by a company called Luster Leaf. And this is actually a pretty cool little test kit that you get. Um, it comes with these different little capsules that have some 
different chemicals in that test for different things. And basically you take some of your soil, it's got, got all the instructions. You take some of your soil, you mix the powder that's in there with them, and then you put the little test tube inside of this digital meter. And after you do that, you just hit the button for either pH, N, P, or K, and it will analyze the color of the liquid, and it will tell you here on the digital display what's going on with your soil. So it's actually a pretty neat little kit. It wasn't super expensive. If I remember, it was around $30 maybe. Don't hold me to that, but I think it was around $30. I'll leave a link to this in our Amazon shop. You know, this isn't as accurate as if you were to send off a sample to like one of the university labs or your state lab or something like that. But those labs take normally several weeks to a month to get back. This you can do right at home. It gives you a pretty good idea so that you can just get a rough idea of what's going on and start to figure out how to fix it. So I would suggest an in-depth soil test uh, at the beginning of the season if you really want to know what's going on. But if you're having issues like we were that you knew needed to be addressed immediately, a soil test like this will give you a basic idea of what's going on in your garden. The next question that we have gotten a lot lately is about how often and for how long we are watering the greenhouse and the raised bed gardens out in our garden area. So we're just, we're just going to tell you what we're doing. The raised bed gardens out in the main garden area, we are watering every day for 10 minutes. But in here in the greenhouse, because of the shade cloth and everything, it doesn't get quite as hot. The sun doesn't beat on the plants as much. The sun doesn't beat on the soil as much. And so we are watering every other day for five minutes. Right. Now these buckets that we have here in the greenhouse, because they have a bottom in them. Now we do have holes so that they have drainage, but they have a bottom in them. So they do hold some moisture in the bottom of the pot, which also makes us be able to reduce how much we water. The raised beds out in the garden have no bottom at all. So that water tends to drain through those raised beds very quickly, which is another reason we need to water out there more often. Now, when we have days where we get a bunch of rain, like within the last 24 hours, we have gotten about two and a half inches of rain. So obviously tonight we will not need to water. And maybe even tomorrow we may not need to water the raised beds outside just because of how much rain we got. But we'll need to double check and kind of stick our finger down in the soil quite a bit and see how moist that is. Right, that's a really difficult question to answer because everybody's climate is so different. If you live in a much more mild climate, you may not need to water much at all. Uh, you may get enough rain. I mean, it's just, it's so variable in different parts of the country. Uh, the other difference is if you're growing in the ground versus in raised beds, that's a, a completely different story. Right, absolutely. When we were using drip irrigation in the ground, in in-ground gardens, uh, we were watering maybe twice a week, but we would water for a longer time frame. We would water for like two hours at a time, right. but less often. Right, with the drip tape like we used to use for our in-ground garden, uh, it puts out only a tiny bit of water at a time. So you water for a very long time so that it gets deep down into the soil. With raised beds, because it's above the ground and that water is going to soak through very quickly, you can use something other than drip and it'll it'll go through the entire bed very quickly. And yes, because the drainage is so amazing right. in a raised bed garden. So that kind of answers your question, I hope. Um, but again, it really comes down to figuring out what the needs are for your specific area. But in our area, that's what we do for our situation. And I think you'll be able to just kind of watch your plants. Right. If they are droopy at the end of the day, you know you're going to need to water either for a longer amount of time or more often. Um, but if they're kind of getting yellow because they're getting too much water, then you'll can back off a little bit. So really you need to wa watch your plants. Right. And in general, most people make the mistake of watering too much yes. than watering too little. So. Uh, fight your urge to water you know two or three times a day just because the weather is hot once a day should be plenty even in hot weather uh, you really just need to watch the plants the next question is kind of two parts 
The first one is a lot of people recently have been wanting to know where our greenhouse came from. Now we've done a ton of videos on this subject in the past. We even did a video as this greenhouse was being put up. But I wanted to talk to you again, again because I understand that we have a lot of new followers who may not have seen some of those older videos. Our greenhouse is from a company called Grower Solutions. You can look that up at growersolution.com. And this greenhouse is a 20 foot wide by 60 foot long uh, greenhouse. It's got eight foot tall sidewalls that roll up and down to be able to let ventilation through. Uh, the one thing that I really wanted to show you is that this greenhouse, you can see all of this bracing up in the top of the greenhouse. We get very strong winds here in Missouri, like you can hear that we're having today. But in the spring, it's sometimes nonstop. We'll get winds like this every day for weeks at a time. And this greenhouse never moves. It doesn't sway side to side. We've never worried about it blowing over. It is, it is really, really sturdy. The poles on the side of the greenhouse are not cemented into the ground. They are just driven into the ground. I think they're in, you know, about two or three feet into the ground, but they are not cemented. And this thing has never moved an inch since it's been put in. So this greenhouse is from Grower Solution, uh, growersolutions.com. You can check them out. Uh, we also have a coupon code LTH10 that will get you 10% off if you decide to buy a greenhouse from them. Uh, and that can really add up what you're buying, you know, especially a bigger greenhouse like this. The other part to that question is, why do we think the plants in the greenhouse, especially peppers, do so much better in here than they do outside? I really think that the peppers in the greenhouse do so much better because of the shade cloth that we put up on the ceiling. The shade cloth that we use is a 40% shade cloth, which means it blocks out 40% of the intensity of the sun. So even though it gets just as hot in here, sometimes even a little hotter than it does outside, the intense sun isn't beating down on these plants all day long like it does outside. It just kind of filters the sun and makes it a much more tolerable environment for all of the plants. I really do think that that is the reason that our plants do so well in the greenhouse. We typically put this shade cloth up somewhere around the end of March, beginning of April, and we leave it up until about the beginning of October. Uh, and that does us really well for all of our summer plants in the greenhouse. Now, along with the shade cloth, I also think that the reason that our plants are doing so well in here the last few years is because of the soil in our tubs. You know that we've had some soil issues out in the garden area this year because those were brand new beds that we just put up this year. Uh, as you know, we figured out that uh, the brand new compost that we put in there was kind of the issue with those plants. In here, we've been amending these pots now for three or four years. So we started with a mixture of 50% uh, compost, 50% potting soil. And over time, every spring, every fall, when we pull plants out, uh, we will amend that with more compost, composted manure, uh, rabbit manure, uh, other things that we can add to the soil to really build it up. And I think that that's the reason that things are doing so well in here, is that this soil is a little more aged and mature uh, and is just better for the plants than the soil was out in the garden this summer. Well, the next question, which we got asked a ton of times, and we actually thought was pretty funny, was about using the milk to kill the aphids here in the greenhouse. Uh, we shared with you recently that ultimately, misting these plants with milk is what cured the aphid problem that we were having here in the greenhouse. The question is this, doesn't your greenhouse stink like rotten milk? <laughs> and you guys, there's no odor at all from the milk. Now, I think that's twofold. I think, one, because we're putting it on pretty lightly. Right. Even before we had the, like, uh, mister thing. The fogger. The fogger. I mean, it stays on the leaves, but then it falls into the soil. And it's not like you're leaving a bucket of milk in here right. to rot. Right. The other thing is, we're using raw milk. Right. Now, raw milk, if you're not familiar with... The difference between raw milk and pasteurized milk or store-bought milk and the way that it ages, raw milk really doesn't ever go bad. Right. I mean, it will 
obviously everything will go bad if you leave it long enough sure. but raw milk sours uh, and will curdle and kind of turn into cheese right but it won't just rot like pasteurized milk only pasteurized milk will actually rot and stink really really bad right so i mean the first thing is we put it on so lightly that it dried on the leaves right. and that is what you know dried on the aphids and suffocated them uh so that's the other thing it just dried and the other thing is it's live you know so even the things that dripped even the parts that dripped dripped into the soil and all that those live enzymes and live bacteria actually fed the soil rather than creating an environment that it would like get stinky and rotten and smelly. Right. So we came out smelling like milk because we had it all over ourselves before right. we were doing the fogger, but we never smelled like rotten milk and the greenhouse never smelled like rotten milk either. Right. Now, we may not have explained really well in that video how the milk kills the aphids. Milk is not like poisonous to sure. aphids. It's not poisonous to the other bugs that come into the greenhouse. In fact, we had that question several times as well is, does the milk kill a lot of the other bugs in the greenhouse as well? And the answer is no, because the milk isn't poisonous. Right. The milk acts almost like an insecticidal soap to right. the aphids. So you, as you know, milk, milk actually has quite a bit of sugar in it. And as it dries on the leaves, that sugar gets very sticky. Uh, but not sticky like where we can feel it, but yeah. it gets sticky on the bugs. And so as it dries and evaporates, it kind of makes the wings of the bugs kind of stick and they can't move around well. And eventually they just kind of suffocate and die right. because they can't keep moving around to eat on the leaves of your plants. And it only is effective on soft bodied bugs. So a lot of you were worried about uh, the ladybugs and the ladybug larvae and all the other good uh, bugs that we have going on here in the greenhouse. It wasn't killing any of those, just the soft bodied uh, bugs like the aphids. So no, our greenhouse does not smell like rotten milk. All of our produce still tastes perfectly fine. Uh, and in fact, adding the milk, not only do the leaves of the plants is you know beneficial in that it killed all the bugs it's also a fungicide right so it kills the fungus on the plants and it also helps fertilize the soil as it drips into the soil now another question that we had quite often was not everybody has access to raw milk can you use pasteurized milk absolutely it will still work in the same exact way, but I do want to assure you that even if you use pasteurized milk, it's not going to smell like rotten milk in your greenhouse right. or in your garden. You're using such a fine amount, it's going to dry on the leaves and what drips off is going to be absorbed into the soil, so don't worry about it. It's not going to be a smelly mess, but the milk from the store will work just as well. And then the last thing about the milk that we've been asked a bunch is, doesn't the smell of the milk attract a lot of other things? And I'm not really sure what people were exactly asking. I don't know if they were talking about like other bugs or like mice and rats or right. ro rodents, things like that. What I can tell you is we've seen no change in what's been in the greenhouse other than the aphids are dead, mm -hmm. uh, but we've still seen the same beneficial insects. We've had no increase in the number of anything else in here. We haven't we never really have a big problem with like mice and rats and stuff right. in our greenhouse. We haven't had that problem now either. So right. I don't think it's attracted anything new. Absolutely And not. I think honestly, the only thing that we've noticed that it did kill was the aphids. Right. Now, speaking of bugs and keeping them off of our plants and out of the greenhouse, we recently had a question about uh, using the roll up sides to keep out the bugs. If we just keep them down all the time, Maybe the bugs won't come in. The bad bugs. Right. And if we don't want to keep it down in order to, you know, keep it cool, maybe we can put up screen over the entire greenhouse to keep out the bad bugs. Right. And while that sounds good, there's really no way to keep out the bad bugs without also keeping out all of the good bugs. Right. So... We have a lot of plants in this greenhouse that require pollinators, but a lot of the plants, especially the things in the squash family, the cucumbers, those all require pollinators to get into the greenhouse. 
So if we were to put like bug netting on the sides of the greenhouse, uh, we would have to hand pollinate all of those plants mm -hmm. and that's just not something that we're willing to do. No, we, we did not have the time to hand pollinate every single flower in here. Right. Uh, the other thing is that the screen or the roll up sides down, they wouldn't prevent the bugs that reproduce by laying eggs in the soil. Right. Actually, like aphids. Generally, aphids will lay their eggs in the soil and then in the spring they hatch and they crawl up your plants and right. then they reproduce. In the fall, they lay more eggs down in the soil. Some of them can fly off to new adventures and other plants like in our garden but the majority of them hatch from eggs in the soil so putting up a screen um, or putting down the roll-up sides that really wouldn't help for bugs that uh, hatch from eggs that they lay right in the soil right now those of you who may be new you may not know what we're talking about with roll-up sides the sides of this greenhouse roll up and down so you can see right now we have this side down to help block the wind we have this side up so that we still have ventilation in here uh, a lot of people were asking like why you know and i think this is this is kind of the thought process that some people had was well in the winter we grow in here and we keep the sides down all winter to help trap the heat in and over winter it doesn't matter there's no po pollinators can't get in in the winter so what's the big deal well in the winter you're not growing things like this that require pollinators in the winter we're growing things like lettuce and collards and other greens right. and those don't require pollinators for the type for the part of the plant that we eat so in the winter when all the pollinators are hibernating it's fine to keep all of the the roll-up sides actually down uh, to keep the warmth in and it's not going to matter because the plants that we are growing in an unheated greenhouse don't need pollinators during that time well hopefully this helped answer some of the questions that you guys have had over the past few videos you know whenever we shoot videos we try really hard to think of all of the possible questions that might come up so that we can try to cover those in the video but inevitably either we don't go in depth enough on a certain subject or sometimes we just don't think of everything so these types of videos I think can really help kind of set the record straight and give you guys more in depth of what we're thinking when we make certain decisions here on the homestead. So you guys, we hope that you enjoyed this kind of Q&A kind of format for this video today. If you're enjoying videos like this, make sure that you hit the subscribe button. And remember, the best way to help us here on the homestead is just to share our videos. Until next time, thank you so much for stopping by our homestead. Take care and God bless. God bless.